This is what we call the long and winding road to autonomous driving, this set of lightning rounds. The first presenter, please welcome Professor Thomas Form, the head of electronics and vehicle research for the Volkswagen Group. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk a bit short time about the long and winding road. I think we've heard a lot of in the morning about very successful um, initiatives from, from competitors, from OEMs. And I think our um, companies um, did a great job by providing um, a good example with the drive from San Francisco to Las Vegas. So I think um, people should have or can have the opinion that automatic driving is really on available within the next years. Um, but unfortunately, I have to say something about what is necessary really to have this technology on the road. And <clears throat> what, what we've done and what we still need to do. And imagine if you drive in sunny weather, I think everybody or a lot of us has experienced the drive in a, in a demonstrator, automatic driving on highways, even in urban environments, on sunny weather, everything is fine. But do we have every time, everywhere, sunny weather? I think in Los Angeles, yes, you would agree. Um, but unfortunately, I come from Germany, um, the situation is a little bit different. Um, so are our automatic driving cars really capable to handle a situation like this? Um, I think there is still a lot to be done. Another situation, you can assume, okay, if there is a bad weather condition, I do not allow automatic driving. But what happens if the cars experience suddenly such a situation, fog or sandstorm or something like this? And this is still a challenge we need to, to solve, and there is a lot of research and development to be done. Um, to solve this. And this is only one part of the story. Um, there will be situations with a car on a road which are really difficult to handle. Imagine a policeman, I didn't found a better picture, but a policeman stopping you in front of a green single traffic light or allowing you to cross over a red light. How a car which, this, which uh, what kind of technology a car should solve the situation. Another thing, some obstacles on the road, these tumbleweeds, our car in the fantastic drive from San Francisco to Las Vegas would have made a full emergency stop in front of the, such a tumbleweed. Yeah? Or imagine these, these snack bars with metallic wrapped paper. Um, a good target for a radar. So we must really differentiate what kind of obstacles are really obstacles for a car and which are not. Or traffic, traffic participants which are of unusual dimensions. And the last thing I would like to mention, uncooperative traffic participants. Yeah? Um, nobody wants to stop for a rabbit, but for a hawk, I think the situation is a little bit different. So there's a lot of technology to be done and to be solved before we really could have automatic driving on the road 24-7 um, so customers can really depend on it. And to be honest, there's still another question to be solved. I think look on the typical driving skills of a population in, in a certain country. Um, I think there will be a Gaussian distribution or a Poisson uh, distribution, and I'm sure that everybody here in this room is well beyond on the right-hand side of the average. Okay. But I'm an engineer, and I know that we will not have a perfect technical system. And I think our colleagues from the aircraft industry, from NASA, from Boeing, from Airbus, experienced it in the past in some accidents and even nuclear power plants failed. So the question will be, an automatic driving vehicle will not be sleeping while driving, obviously. It will not drink alcohol or take other drugs. But 
there will be situations where an automatic driving car will be overwhelmed by the situation. A situation where a human driver, or we afterwards, will evaluate the situation and saying, I, as a driver, would never fail in this kind of situation. So the question is, how good an autopilot, an automatic driving car, must drive before to be allowed to drive on the road? But what kind of driving skills this car must have? And by agreeing on this level of driving skills, agreeing to what the car will not be capable to handle. So there will be accidents with automatic driving cars, and we must discuss beforehand what kind of level our cars must have to be uh, uh, before they uh, will be allowed uh, to be on the road. Um, we have started a large public funded research project in Germany with the government, together with, with all stakeholders, so stakeholders from industries, governmental organizations and, and safety organizations to looking into the question what kind of level of, of driving skills um, our cars must have before they are allowed to drive on the road. And I would encourage the United States to participate in this, this initiative. I think because we must solve this question before we have these cars on the road and not afterwards when we will have a severe discussion which will not uh, give this technology a positive um, value. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity <clears throat> and I'm looking forward um, for um, the discussion lying ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, that's, uh, that's the view from the Volkswagen Group. And now I want to bring up uh, Brian Dressler, who is VP of Strategy for one of the largest uh, providers, suppliers of technology and equipment to the automakers. Please welcome Brian Dressler from Continental. Thank you, Brian. Ladies and gentlemen, it is truly a long and winding road. The idea of an autonomous vehicle is not new. In the 1920s, in the 50s, in the 80s, and very recently, the hype and the drive to find a way for a car to drive itself uh, has never been greater. Even when considering this hype, we have many challenges to solve. Technically, we're at a point where never before have we had so many different technologies that will allow us to make this a reality. But there are still many things to consider. We've already used some of these technologies and applied them in very important ways. We applied it to safety. Think back to the first time you got into a car with anti-lock brakes. Here was a system that electronically was going to stop the car. Did you trust it? I didn't. I didn't at first. But slowly we did. And we realized that that vibration and that rattle and that computer behind it could actually stop the car faster than any human could do it. But we have a lot of work to do. We must solve some other challenges. We must define a view of the road ahead of the vehicle, the electronic horizon. We must still, as an industry, solve the liability issues. And already we see some car makers stepping up to this task. We also must work on the HMI, the human machine interface. How does this vehicle work intuitively and comfortably with the consumer? In the end, it's all about trust. And all of these curves along this winding road will lead us ultimately to cars that are safer, more economical, and comfortable that consumers trust. I want to focus on two of these items today, eHorizon and HMI. These are two important concept, concepts that help close the loop between driver, the environment, and the vehicle. Now, this looks good on a PowerPoint slide, but it truly is a loop that we must close and solve. And it will take a close cooperation amongst the people in this room, the automakers, the tier ones, and our technology partners. So eHorizon, it's all about increasing the sensor range of the vehicle beyond the typical 300 meter implement, uh, uh, sensors today in the vehicle. 
We want to make sure that the vehicle and the consumer are informed about what's happening on the road ahead. Using a combination of GPS technologies, LTE, car-to-car -car communications, cloud-based computing as well, uh, we, we bring this information to the vehicle. And if this, is, if this wasn't challenging enough, we must do all this in real time and with enough lead time for the vehicle and the consumer to take the decisions. So the solution for eHorizon, let's look at it step by step. eHorizon starts with a very accurate GPS-based map to give lane-level accuracy, local to the vehicle. Then the onboard sensors are fused together to create a very short-term view of the vehicle needed for immediate decisions. Next, we fuse together additional data from outside dynamic sources. This might be road conditions, this might be traffic conditions, road closures, links to DOT databases. All of that comes into the vehicle to make decisions. What happens? The maps get better. Traffic information gets better. The road condition information gets better for the consumer. And therefore, the autonomous vehicle and the driver are better informed and can take the decisions. It's very clear in this scenario, the car truly becomes part of the internet of everything. Next, let's talk a little bit about HMI. I want to share maybe some new research that you, you might not be aware of. Uh, Continental has done a lot of research in human-machine interface, and it's really uh, at an area that we will have much more research to do. But I'd like to share something new, something you can take away today. Number one is multimodality. We did some really interesting tests where we tested multiple ways to alert the consumer. Of course, there's audio alerts. Uh, there's some visual alerts that you could do, maybe an animation on the screen, a warning light, maybe a LED strip of lights on the dashboard. But you can uh, vibrate the gas pedal. We have those products in production today. You can vibrate the seats. You could even slightly apply the brakes, creating a slight jerk. And through all of those, tested individually, we actually found that consumers responded best to audio indications and that slight application of the brakes. Now, I'm not sold on that one. I, I would need to experience it myself. But this is the type of testing and vetting that we will need to do as an industry to determine what the right multimodal HMI components are. Next is spatial reference. This is all about trying to direct the attention of the consumer where you think they should be looking, perhaps, or paying attention. Uh, we tested just a few uh, methods of spatial reference. One was uh, this LED light strip on the front dash. Another was audio signals that are spatially uh, uh, activated. And another was uh, animations and visual alerts, more static. Uh, we actually found that audio alerts, by far, were more intuitive and easier for the consumer to understand than visual. In fact, there's a point where the visual alerts may even become distracting, and we're not intuitive at bringing the consumer back into perhaps the driving task or where you wanted that consumer to look for a problem. Last is uh, adaptive warning strategy. There's nearly an infinite number of combinations of these methods that I've spoke about in combination with how you stage the timing of warnings, calling the driver to action, and then finally the vehicle taking a decision to intervene and avoid an incident. We think that this is one of the greatest achievements that we as an industry will solve as we ride on this road towards the autonomous vehicle. In fact, this will be an area where we see car makers differentiating the experience that you have with their brand in the vehicle during the autonomous driving scenarios. And last, so what about the future of HMI? So there are many new technologies for HMI. You can, see, you can read the slide. But how to connect them together in something that's intuitive and holistic? In closing, allow me to paint just one scenario of what we envision going forward. It starts with an interior camera. When you get into the vehicle, this camera's watching what you're doing, watching your eye gaze. Onboard systems are better informed about what you're doing. Connections to cloud systems are engaged to help you plan your route and present the information uh, to, to start your journey. The heads-up cluster and center stack, dis center stack displays adapt seamlessly to quickly present the driver with this information. And once underway, the consumer uh, starts to 
uh, you look at their daily candle, calendar brought in through the telematics connection. And sometime during the drive, there's a, there's a new family vacation that we need to plan. So the consumer starts to surf the web. Near the end of the journey, the vehicle through the multimodal alerts brings the driver back into the task of driving. The consumer arrives safely, comfortably at their destination with a newly purchased ticket to Hawaii for the family. Now this is uh, uh, quite, a, quite a future that we, we, we as an industry will achieve, but I'm convinced that HMI, eHorizon, and the technical challenges we will solve as an industry will lead to safer cars that are more economical and more fun to drive, that people trust. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Brian. Thank OK, you. and now uh, one more point of view before we open up this panel to questions. And uh, this is Gary O'Brien. He is the global head of advanced engineering for another major supplier that brings these components, like Continental, to the car makers for integration. Please welcome Gary O'Brien, head of global, engin uh, global uh, advanced engineering for Delphi. Good morning. So today what I want to talk to you about is the, uh, the road to automated driving. So if we look at that, what I'd like to try to convince you of today, as a sensor designer for the past 25 plus years, that this road is paved with sensors. So if we look at these sensors, we look at this first application up here. 1959, we have an automatic cruise control. So this looked at the sensors inside the car, the velocity or the speed for the car, and actually regulated the throttle position to keep that speed constant. But again, that looks inside the car. So we look at the next innovation. We, it takes 40 years to get to 1999, the next big one. We look at automatic cruise control. This is radar to actually help with cruise control. So not only does it maintain the speed, but it actually looks at objects in front of the vehicle with radar. Now what this does with radar, you actually not only get the distance, but you get the velocity of the object in front of you as well. So this really takes that, that looking outside the car to a new level. So now not only are we looking inside the car from the 50s, but in the 90s, we're actually looking outside the car. The next big step is 2010, we do this pedestrian de detection system. Now this is vision plus radar. Why is this important? Now, if you look at radar, if you look at 76 gigahertz radar, the, the wavelength for 76 gigahertz radar is around four millimeters. For those of us that think in inches, that's about 0.16 inches. So if I hold up my hand, you'd be very hard pressed if you could see in the radar range or the radar spectrum to see my fingers. My palm would, find, would be fine, you'd see that but my fingers would look like a noise pattern. But in the visual spectrum, you can see that quite easily. Everyone in the room can see I have five fingers up. So essentially what you get is if I look at this green laser, this is 532 nanometers versus 76 gigahertz radar. If I look at the wavelengths of those, of those two uh, different spectrums from four millimeters to 532 nanometers, that's about 8,000 X. That means in the visual range, I, I can see about 8,000 times better if I use a visual pixel analogy of an object. So what we do in this 2010 scenario is we use vision to actually identify targets. Is it a car? Is it a dog? Is it, is it a pedestrian? Radar's not good at that. Radar's great at velocity and, and distance. Vision is great at actually figuring out what the object is. The fusion of the two is really where the innovation comes for AEB, or automatic electronic braking. So if we actually go down the road a little bit, I've got a slide. I'll talk about this 360 degree sensing a little bit on further slides. And the last item on this slide is this uh, V to V and V to X. We're in production now as, as of 2015 for V to V and V to X modules in North America, and this will be in a production vehicle for 2016. So if, if we look at this, this market study, all I'm trying to show here is from 2014 to 2020, the ADAS, or Advanced uh, Driver Assisted uh, System Sensors, are at the, the market is actually growing and it's quite healthy. Now, if we look at automated vehicles, what's important from a sensor standpoint here, if I look at the ADAS class? Only a few. The forward vision camera is very important. This electronic scanning radar that I'll talk about in the next slide is very important as well. And if I put those two together, I end up with Raycam. This is radar and camera added together. To do that, that vehicle identification where I'm going to look at the distance and velocity of an object and actually tell you what it is. Is it a car? Is it a, is it a deer? Is it, is it a dog or a person? So, uh, and then the last thing I'll talk about is this rear and side detection radar system. These are important for blind spot detection as well. And for those of you that want to see the Raycam, if you look at the Volvo XC90 that was on the third floor last night, if you look right behind the rear view mirror, this is a Raycam system from Delphi. So if, if I actually look at one of these radars, and if I look at down here, I'm going to pop a car in there. So what happens is with this long range scanning, uh, 200 meters out, which is a long range radar, with a 20 degree angle window, we're actually going to scan for objects to actually see how fast they're moving and how far away they are from the vehicle. 
Now this same radar actually switches every 50 milliseconds from what we call long range radar to medium range radar and actually has a wider angle. So this actually looks at cars in the lanes next to you as well. And this same radar uh, device actually does the switching without anybody knowing it's going on in the background. And this is a part of the NADAS system that's in vehicles now. Now if you add vision to that radar system, this is the mar marriage of the two, and you actually put the camera on the radar itself, and this is what's in that Volvo XC90, what you'd actually see is this gives you the ability to actually have a lot of features that you need to get to a five-star safety rating. And what you actually see here is the automa uh, automated electronic braking, traffic jam assist, um, and you've also got the uh, adaptive cruise control. Now the last thing I want to talk about for the 360 degree sensing is I've shown a car over here in the corner. Now what, I've, what I'm showing is the front right quarter panel, and this is another radar. This has a wider angle. It's, uh, as you can see here, it's 150 degrees, and this is used for blind spot detection. So this is what we consider to be the medium range radar, and that same unit, the same one here, actually switches and actually also does a short range radar. Now the bandwidths between these two are, are different. This is 250 megahertz and this is 500 megahertz. So what happens is, even though it's a 76 gigahertz radar, this is the data of the bandwidth that we look at in, in that data. So this has more resolution closer to the car. So we actually have uh, twice the resolution closer to the car, and this is what we actually use to sense cars and lanes that are actually gonna change lanes next to us. So if I actually put another one of those on the car in the back right quarter panel and I keep going around the corners, I end up with a cocoon of radar around the vehicle and I can actually drive and see exactly what's going around me in all directions. So, and this actually gives us that front rear side detection system. So, essentially, this would be the forward looking radar on the vehicle and now if we add the medium range radar, now you can actually see that wider angle that we're actually looking at other lanes as well. And now you have the vision system to identify, is it a dog, is it a deer, is it a person, is it a car? And then you have that 360 degree radar to actually look, you know, is someone coming up at me on my blind spot? Now the addition of LIDAR actually gets back to a frequency that's close to light, so it gives me a high resolution. So if somebody does hold up their hand, with LIDAR I can actually get that distance information and tell you it's a finger. And the combination of all of these actually gives me a, a very high integrity system to do automated driving. So let's, let's watch a video that used all these sensors to do an autonomous drive from uh, San Francisco to New York City uh, this past year. One of the most buzzed about showings at the Consumer Electronics Show was a preview of the driverless car. We can expect to see urban driverless technology like this hit the market in the next 10 years. For the PBS NewsHour in Las Vegas, I'm Steve Goldblum. The idea for this trip came about after a very successful show in CES 2015 in January. So we started to think, what would benefit the technology and also what would help us prove out uh, that this car is capable of, of moving to market quickly. We decided that collecting two and a half terabytes of data and being the first to go coast to coast in, in the United States with a self-driving car or an automated car would be pretty compelling. How does a car drive itself? An analogy that we like to make when you ask is think about how a human works. If you think about your eyes, your ears, and your nose as the sensors, the same thing happens with vision and radar and laser on the vehicle. The controller is kind of like your brain, and the smart logic and the software that runs on that is really the heart and soul of how the car drives itself. Okay, one note about that, this drive, it actually was 99.9% um, autonomous. The only time we switched out of autonomous mode was entrance and exit ramps on the highway. So from San Francisco to New York, the entire highway drive was autonomous. So again, uh, just a few of the, the scenarios that were encountered, construction, tunnels, metal bridges, and lane hogs, and the vehicle did really well in all these scenarios. In fact, it wasn't switched back into autonomous mode by the drivers at any point during the drive. Um, just a few key findings. Radar sensors perform well in almost all conditions. LiDAR sensors are recommended for use with radar. It gives you a higher confidence signal. So radar gives you a distance and velocity. LiDAR just gives you distance, but at least it gives me a higher confidence interval if I have two sensors to give me distance information to the same target. So as, as a sensor designer or a system designer, I would, I'd like to have multiple signals that I can actually compare against each other. Just gives me more confidence. And vision performed well in most conditions, but uh, we didn't test it in non-harsh weather, or harsh weather conditions. You know, and it's possible to operate an auto automated mode in nearly 100% of the time on US highways. And then these are just a couple of the findings we'd like to actually uh, take a little further. So increase the camera databases to actually have more diverse lane markings and, and more signage. 
improve the dynamic range of the camera for sunlight and um, dim lit conditions at night. Uh, harsh, harsh weather conditions, which was talked about previously, is also a problem, snow, rain, and ice. And actually uh, adapt the uh, vac uh, uh, automated vehicle algorithm behavior for a more natural acceleration deceleration experience. And that's it. Thanks. Okay, three, uh, three expert views of where this technology is coming from and how it gets implemented. Uh, and thank you all. I want to keep us on time with just a few questions here. So if you've got a question, go to one of the microphone stands and we'll take those briefly with brief <coughs> answers. While we're teeing that up, I want to ask you guys one thing that I noticed throughout your, throughout your talks. If I, if I had this right, none of you are leaning too hard at this Connected Car Conference on connectivity enabling self-driving. At what point does it become really valuable to have connectivity of the car out to either other cars or infrastructure versus the sensor-based world that Gary just <coughs> laid out for us in such detail? Yeah, I think the um, sensors are needed to drive safely, to drive in a safe manner. There's no discussion that the car must have all means to, by itself on board to drive safe. The connectivity is needed to look far ahead um, to get more information to drive comfortable, yeah, to, to increase the, the level of, of driving so it's, it's not only safe but comfortable and convenient. Okay, a bigger picture, a bigger yeah. view of yeah. the yeah. bigger scenario. Yeah, from, from, from my perspective, uh, exactly the same thing. It will, it will take both. However, when you consider uh, the vehicle needs to take a real-time emergency decision that needs to be based on the near-term sensors, for sure. But in the automotive industry, there's a, a standard called ASIL, and this requires that uh, a system has to operate even if perhaps uh, uh, the main system cuts out, there needs to be some redundancies. When you talk about a connected system, now you have to assume that connection might be cut. So you will always have to default back to the vehicle taking a final decision. <clears throat> yeah, and for me, I showed on the first slide, the V to X and V to V mm -hmm. is super important because I can share my sensor data with the car in front of me and behind me. So I can sh share not my speed data with the car in front of me and behind me, but I can also see their speed data. So I can actually look at my radar data, compare it to their speed data, and actually get a higher resolution signal. And I can actually see if, if they have an event going on. Are they going through a, a, an anti-skid routine? Am I, should I be worried about traction in front of me, in front of the, with the vehicle in front of me, and should I actually take evasive maneuvers or go to a higher level of, uh, of uh, perception all right. of what's happening around me? A uh, quick uh, glossary entry for you all. You're going to hear this term a lot. V to V, vehicle to vehicle. That's cars talking to each other, to put it in common parlance. It's uh, based on a technology called DSRC, uh, dedicated short-range communications, that the U.S. is still set to bake a spec on. Is that right? It's still sort of not cooked yet. Okay. But there are units that are being, so there, there'll be cars in North America, the production cars in 2016. We actually manufacture the first um, V2V and V2X system. And it's actually, it's, we're in production now and the units will ship in 2016 vehicles in North America. Okay. And V2X is the vehicle talking to the broader infrastructure, right? Uh, smart tr roads, smart intersections, traffic signals, that like. So when you hear those terms, that's how the car starts to branch out from its own sensors to speak to broader infrastructure. I'm going to get a couple of quick questions. Uh, sir, go ahead. What's your question for the panel? Uh, Saran Sagina from LA Car. In your world, uh, if the technology at one point uh, is inadequate, it will give the control of the car to the driver, who at that time, because he has spent his life being driven in automated cars won't be able to react because his driving skills will deteriorate. If you wish to see how it works in the airline industry, talk to people who are on the bottom of the ocean of French uh, Flight 441 and Asiana Airline in San Francisco in which the pilots had such bad skills that without automation they were unable to land the plane. How do you resolve the problem of horrible driver who has never driven and panics when given the control of the car. Is that a technical issue or a policy issue or a different it's a, training it's a, expectation I issue? I think it's a diff difficult question. I mean, I think we have to consider what will uh, uh, a driver's license uh, requirement be in the future, right? If, if consumers rely on these technologies, I think there is a certain aspect that they may over rely. And how we solve that, I think, will take some policy decisions, some insurance decisions, and uh, 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 decisions about how that happens and what consumers need to have as a minimum basis before they're granted the ability to drive in those cars or, or ride. 
Professor Form? Yeah, I think the, you mentioned the HMI. Uh, what must not happen is that in a certain critical situation, the, the car handles the control back to the, to the driver, saying, OK, I'm not capable. Um, please solve the situation. I think this is something really out of the scope because it, it would not um, work in, in reality. So either the car is capable to drive by itself and provides the driver a huge safety margin um, by if, if he encounters a situation, he must know really in advance, the car must know in advance, when to give the control back to the driver, we are talking about at least 10 seconds. Um, but you are right, um, by, by giving back the, the, the control to, to the car, um, the driver get less practice, and I think we must compensate this with a better education, even in, in, by getting your, your driver license, something like this. Yeah. Gary, thoughts on this? Yeah, I think we have to just consider that the, the driver is kind of the top of the pyramid when it comes to a wide spectrum of driving circumstances. People are going to be much better than any algorithm that we can develop and actually code into a computer. So um, the, when the uh, control is transferred back to the person, we have to assume that they can, they're an adequate driver and they, they passed a driver's license test. So I, at least the, that's my standpoint. I think the driver's still going to have to have the skills to be able to take the, yeah. car, the vehicle yeah. back over. The driver, the driver factor doesn't leave the equation. It just is handed off back and forth to the yeah. car. But we don't ever foresee a future immediately where the driver can be a poor driver. We still have to have that factor in there. Okay, thank you for the question. I'll have time for one more, and then we're going to move on to our next element. Sir, uh, who are you with, and what's your question? Yeah, Henry Payne with the Detroit News. Uh, two questions. One, uh, how, how do you find uh, the driver interacts best with the car? Is it with audio commands or mechanical commands in the case of an autonomous car? And uh, second question, uh, what has to be done in a regulatory um, uh, space to, to, to get us to an autonomous car? Um, the VW gentleman talked about the policy group in Germany. Is there a group with NHTSA in the United States that's currently on a track to license a, uh, uh, an autonomous car on a public road? Thanks. OK, some brief answers on that. What's the best interface to control an autonomous car? <clears throat> I think um, the best is, is multimodal. So um, we have uh, in our, our demonstrator cars, um, the steering wheel retracts a little bit. Um, there's a change of the color on, on, on the dashboard, the LED bar, and you get a clear display information for all passengers in the car, not only the passenger on the driver's seat, um, what the car is intending to do within the next seconds, what kind of maneuver. Um, so everybody in the car knows what, what, what's going on and what, what will happen. And giving back the control to the driver, um, audio, and visual um, information is, I think, the best um, solution. OK. And I think I've, that seems to be a common thread. We have a multimodal interface world. Let's talk about the regulation landscape. Uh, in the US, anyway, there's a lot of discussion in the industry about wanting a federal, national landscape of regulations. We do have states like California that are getting out in front of even the feds in many ways. Many of the manufacturers and suppliers, I, if I can speak for you, dread a patchwork of regulation that affects the usage of your technologies. Where do we stand in a uniform US regulatory environment? Are we doing well on that? I'll defer to these guys. I'm an engineer, so I'll, I'll let these are more <laughs> policy. <laughs> well, I'm an engineer too, but I, I will say it is a patchwork today. We see yeah. some states, Nevada and, and California, and a couple others, Michigan, that are uh, licensing self-driving vehicles to be on the roads already today. Um, but I think there's a whole other part of the industry in terms of insurance and solving that liability issue that I talked about. There's a three or four OEMs who in the last six months have come out and said, we will stand behind our autonomous vehicles, that they will take the liability. Now, I think you need to read the fine print. What, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. how, how does the insurance uh, uh, industry you know, pick up and cover you versus the OEM is covering that vehicle? And then uh, in states and municipalities, do we need certain roads that are uh, segments of the road that will be only for autonomous driving? That whole regulatory and infrastructure, I think, still needs to be worked out. It's a patchwork. <clears throat> Last thought, is VW Group holding any self-driving tech off the market right now because regulation is too fractured? No. no or is it no. strictly an engineering question? No, no, no. <laughs> I think regulation is, 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 is still a challenge. You must 
No, in, in Europe, in the European Union, we have 27 or 28 member states with, with different laws. In the United States, you have 50 member states um, with different laws and, and different road markings. I think your experience is on your drive um, from coast to coast. Yeah. Um, that's really a challenge. And, and the automotive industry is more used to, to have a global view and, and eager to have m more global regulations. So there's no need to, to have special variants for each country or each state. Yeah. Okay. But again, I think that te technology uh, challenges are huge in comparison to the legal. There's plenty to be done there right now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, big hand please for our representatives here from Delphi, Continental, and Volkswagen. Thank you, gentlemen, appreciate it. Okay.